Okay, if I can get your attention, we're going to start this evening uh, with our public hearing for our, our Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas uh, report, our first report. And what we're going to do is our Executive Director of Finance, Darren Rice, is going to present that information. And then if anybody has a comment, I'll ask you to come to the podium. If you'll state your name and if you'll keep your comments to about two minutes, we'd appreciate that. So at this time, I'll ask Darren Rice to present the information. Thank you. President Sanders, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, it's my privilege tonight to be able to present to you all the School Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas Annual Financial Management Report, or FIRST Report. I would like to say that this report is online, and we have some hard copies over here if you like it. The purpose of the Financial Accountability Rating System is to ensure that school districts will be held accountable for the quality of their financial management practices and achieve improved performance in the management of their financial resources. The school first rating is based upon an analysis of staff and student data reported for the 2012-2013 school year and budgetary and actual financial data for the fiscal year ended August 31st, 2013. The School First Accountability Rating System assigns one of four financial accountability ratings to Texas school districts, superior achievement, above standard, standard, or substandard. Conroe Independent School District received a rating of superior achievement. The superior achievement rating is the state's highest, demonstrating the quality of Conroe ISD's financial management and reporting system, and we, have, we achieved this rating with a perfect score. And for the 12 years that the first program has been in existence, we have received the superior achievement rating. The school first rating system rated Texas districts based on their answers to 20 separate questions. Each question was designed to assess the quality of the financial management of the district's resources. Now we'll go through the 20 questions uh, in the first uh, report, and then we'll also have some additional disclosures at the end of that that we're required to go over with y'all. The first question was the total fund balance less non-spendable and restricted fund balance greater than zero in the general fund? Our answer was yes, we had $98,977,901. Number two, was the total unrestricted net asset balance in the governmental activities column in the statement of net assets greater than zero? Our answer is yes, $56,775,021. Question number three, were there no disclosures in the annual financial report and or other sources of information concerning default on bonded indebtedness obligations? Basically, did we pay our bills? And yes, we did. Number four, was our annual report filed in a timely manner? Yes, it was. Number five, was there an unqualified opinion in the annual financial report? And our goal is to receive an annual uh, unqualified opinion, so yes, we did meet that goal. <clears throat> Number six, did the annual financial report not disclose any instances of material weakness in internal controls? Basically, did we receive a clean audit? And yes, we did. Number seven, was the three-year average percent of total tax collection, including delinquent, greater than 98%? And our answer is yes, 99.76%. Number eight, did the comparison of PEAMS data to like information in the annual financial report result in an aggregate variance of less than 3% of expenditures per fund type? Our answer is yes, we had no variance. Uh, number nine, any one of these three categories, you get credit for this point, and in the middle is the one that we match. If the district's five-year percent change in students is equal to or greater than 7%, and ours was 12.27. <clears throat> Number 10, was there no disclosure in the annual audit report of material noncompliance? Basically, were we complying with our laws and rules of government entities? And yes, we were. Number 11, did the district have full accreditation status in relation to financial management practices? Yes. Number 12, was the aggregate of budgeted expenditures and other uses less than the aggregate of total revenues, other resources, and fund balance in the general fund? And our answer is yes. 
Number 13, if the district's <coughs> aggregate fund balance in the general fund and capital projects fund was less than zero, were construction projects adequately financed? Yes, our aggregate fund balance was $130,836,174. Number 14, was the ratio of cash and investments to deferred revenues in the general fund greater than or equal to one to one? And our answer is yes. Number 15, was the administrative cost ratio less than the standard in state law? Conroe's answer is yes. The acceptable administrative cost ratio is 0 0.1105 and Conroe's ratio 0.0364. Number 16 was a ratio of students to teachers within the ranges shown below according to district size. And the range for a ratio for districts with students population equal to or greater than 10,000 is a low of 13.5 and a high of 22. And our ratio was 16.7. Number 17 was a ratio of students to total staff within the ranges shown below according to district size. The range for a district equal to or greater than 10,000 is a low of seven and a high of 14, and our ratio was 8.69. Number 18, with a decrease in undesignated fund balance less than 20% over two fiscal years, we had no decrease in fund balance. Number 19, was the aggregate total cash and investments in the general fund more than zero? And our answer is yes. Our balance was $113,797,587. And the last question, were investment earnings in all funds, excluding debt service and capital projects, did it meet or exceed the three-month treasury bill rate? And our answer is yes. Now the final uh, part of this is just some additional disclosures uh, that we're required to, to provide everyone. And the first one is any reimbursements received by the superintendent and board members. And the only one to receive any reimbursements was the superintendent. Uh, this was for travel and the reimbursement total of $1,403.44. The next disclosure is any outside compensation and or fees received by the superintendent for professional consulting and or professional services, and there were none. Uh, the next disclosure is, did the board or superintendent receive any gifts of value of $250 or more, and there was none. The next disclosure is any business transactions between the school district and board members. And we do have one. That's Mr. John Sussman, who works for Souls Insurance. Our transaction was $906,750. But I would like to note that the above amount reflects normal business transactions between Conroe ISD and the employers of Mr. Husband's, which is Souls Insurance. And Mr. Husband receives no commissions from these revenues, and this relationship predates his membership on the board. Now just some uh, accounting. They like to uh, have us disclose what our first quarter expenditures were by object. So for the first quarter of the 13-14 school year, our payroll was $71.3 million. Our contracted cost, which is our utilities, was $9 million. Supplies and materials, $7.5 million. Other operating, $2 million. And capital outlay, $780,000. Some additional financial solvency questions. Uh, within the last two years, did the school district draw funds from short-term financing note? The answer is no. And for the prior fiscal year, have a total general fund balance of less than 2%? The answer is no. Uh, question number two, has the school district declared financial extendency within the past two years? The answer is no. Number three, we have nothing to explain because we're within all the ratios. Question number four, how many superintendents has your school district had in the last five years? The answer is one. Question number five, how many business managers has your school district had in the last five years? The answer is one. And the last disclosure is uh, we're required to have a copy of the superintendent's contract. Now I'm not gonna read the contract for you, but once again, it is posted online at the finance website. And uh, there's also a hard copy here for, for you to have if you'd like. Okay, this time I'll ask if anybody has a comment. If you'll come to the podium and state your name and make your comments, please. Mr. Rice, I do believe this is the largest crowd that's ever showed up to see okay. here in this presentation, which is, which is great. Okay, that concludes our public hearing. Thank you.
Uh, by the way, Darren. Yes, sir. Wow, you got it. Oh, you nice. <laughs> I wanted to do that for 10 years. <laughs> I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is now 612. If you would, please stand and join me as Dr. Brown leads us in the invocation and the pledges. Let's pray. Our Father, first of all, I want to thank you that we're able to live in a country where we enjoy the privileges that we have. I ask your watch care over the men and women in our armed forces who serve to give us the freedoms that we do have. I ask that uh, you, that this, you help these, uh, those of us on the board to always uh, be aware of the needs of our children, their need to be cared for, their need to learn, their, their need to achieve. Help us in our planning to make sure that we address all of these. But as we plan, help us to also think about the present. To neglect it would be just as, as tragic as failing to plan for the future. Guide us, and as we make decisions, help us to realize that if we only make decisions with our head, that uh, we can come across as uncaring. But on the other hand, if we only make decisions with our heart, we can be irrational. So help us to balance our decision making. Guide us in all that we do and help us to be accountable to our students, our faculty, our staff, our administration, and, our, uh, and the taxpayers of the school district. These things we humbly pray. Amen. 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 Join me as we pledge our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now our state flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to be Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Dr. Brown. <clears throat> Item 2A. Patrons Influencing Education Award, Dr. Stockton. All right, I'll ask Dr. Curtis Null, our Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education, to come and make the first presentation. Good evening, President Sanders, Dr. Stockton, and members of the board. It is an honor to be here this evening to introduce our recipient of the October 2014 Patrons Influencing Education Award. The story of Warner Phelps' involvement in Conroe ISD dates back over 30 years when he began as a kindergartner at B.B. Rice he then continued on to Reeves Intermediate, Travis Junior High, and was the Conroe High School student body president as a senior in 1996. While we are very proud of what Warner did as a student in Conroe ISD, it is his work in the district as an adult that has brought us here this evening. In 2009, Warner heard a presentation by Conroe High School at the Conroe Noon Lions Club asking for volunteers to help mentor students. And so began his work in Conroe schools. Warner served as a student mentor at Conroe High School from 2009 to 2013 and served as a Leo Club liaison from 2010 to 2013. In addition to working with the Leos, he helped coordinate the Conroe Noon Lions involvement in the campus, including the formation of a school-wide attendance incentive program. His most recent work is focused at Reeves Elementary. Warner serves on the Reeves School Improvement Committee and in 2012 led the charge for the Conroe Noon Lions to officially adopt Reeves. As a liaison between the campus and the club, he organizes volunteer classroom readers, field day volunteers, and the e-club behavior incentive. His work as a mentor continues at Reeves, where the program he helped to create now serves 19 children that attend Reeves, Cryer, and Travis. Finally, and maybe most impressively, Warner has used his connections in the North Pole to make certain that Santa personally visits 
Reeves Elementary every year on Polar Express Day, and every boy and girl receives a book as a gift. Warner is an advocate for the students of Connor ISD. To hear him speak and recruit more adults to come in and mentor children allows you to see the love and compassion in his heart. His work has led to great respect and admiration from parents and educators, and a sense of hope for students who may have doubts about their future. He is a man of character and class and gives selflessly of himself and his time, and we are proud to call him a Conroe ISD graduate and volunteer. Please join me in recognizing our Pi Award recipient, Mr. Warner Phelps. President Sanders, Dr. Stockton, and the board, thank you very much for this award. Um, I had intended to write some stuff down, but I'd like the record to reflect that John Husbands pestered me for most of the day today, and I was, <laughs> I was unable to write anything down. So um, We understand. And I can see by the looks on all your faces that you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, first of all, my wife and son are here. Thank you to them for the support and inspiration that they uh, give me. Um, the faculty and staff of Reeves are a lot of support and inspiration for me as well. Um, it, it's just, it's a little bit um, bittersweet, I guess, that uh, a lot of Giesinger staff are here. Um, you know, my mom had so much uh, energy that she put into that school. Uh, so. I guess what, what I would like for people to take away, anything that, if, they, if you get anything out of this besides I am hilarious and John Husbands is annoying, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's that um, you never know uh, what energy you pour into a child will, will do later on. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, when, when Dr. No called me a couple of Fridays ago and I, I kind of had some time to think about it, I, I thought of, all the teachers that I had over the years that saw something in me that um, that they continued to polish up until, you know, I, I'm able to do things for, for kids now because of that. So um, thanks again, and uh, this is a really great award. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. First, first, I'd like to say on behalf of Dr. Stockton and the board that uh, we are very proud of your service in CISD and uh, in, in your donation of time on behalf of the children of CISD. And no pie award would be complete without a hot apple pie to make it a pie award, okay? I had several other nice things to say about you. <laughs> but we'll, we'll talk about those in the morning. <laughs> Can you be there early? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, let me let me just say this. We we tease and and I'm, I'm the world's worst, so I can take it as well as dish it out. Uh, we we have a blessing at uh, Souls Insurance to have Warner on staff. He is personal lines manager of Souls Insurance now, and uh, you know everything his mother taught him didn't stick, but it, some of it did. And so um, he, he is a, he's a pleasure to work with, a pleasure to know the character and the and the good humor and the love he shows for other people is obviously true in everything that he does, including at, at on our on at our office. And so Warner, on behalf of the board, Dr. Stockton and administration, Reeves, Conroe, Giesinger, and all the rest of them, thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. And would you also, oh, they're standing up for you again. That's two standing ovations I got. I think, I think they want you to push this pie in my face. <laughs> I thought about it, but would you introduce your family that's with you? Um, my lovely wife, Kara, is here. And my little first grader, Delton, the sweetest boy in the world.
one, and we appreciate you very much. Very good, sir. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor. <coughs> Item 2B, Special District Recognition. Dr. Stockton? Well, all of our recognitions are, are special. That's probably why we call them Special District Recognitions. This is should be called the Extra Special District Recognition. And to make this Extra Special um, Recognition, I'll ask Dr. Gibson, who's our Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Education, to come to the podium. Good evening, President Sanders, board members, and Dr. Stockton. Approximately 10 months ago, Giesinger Elementary was nominated by the Texas Education Agency to participate in the rigorous award process for the United States Department of Education National Blue Ribbon Schools program as a high-performing school. National Blue Ribbon Schools represent the diversity of the American schools, including public, private, urban, suburban, and rural schools. The eligibility process for this award was of the highest standards and in, in rigor, including an in-depth study of the academic performance over a five-year period. The campus must meet all state accountability standards for both tax and star assessment platforms for all students and student groups. And the campus must be in compliance and good standing with all expectations of the Texas Education Agency, the United States Department of Education, and the United States Department of Justice. Giesinger Elementary will be one of 25 Texas schools recognized by the U.S. Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan. The, the Department of Ed will honor 287 public and 50 private schools at a, rec at a recognition ceremony on November 11th in Washington, in Washington, D.C., where each school receives a plaque and a U.S. flag. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mayor uh, Webb Melder, uh, Mayor of City of Conroe, who will present a proclamation. May I, uh, first of all, say thank you on behalf of the City of Conroe, County Seat, President Sanders and the board, Superintendent Stockton. Uh, we listed a little earlier here, and I know my role here, but I'm having so much fun. Would you grant me a minute or two to share 51 years of history with you? Sure. Uh, I was going to say something nice about Warner in hopes of getting a piece of the pie, but he left. <laughs> um, you know, um, some of you here in the crowd have 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 known me 51 years. Hello, Becky Page. And um, wow, is all I can say. Congratulations, first of all, on an absolutely outstanding financial awards presentation. Uh, sitting where we sit, <laughs> we know the impact and the value of transparency and proper fiscal reporting and accountability. Uh, it just, it means the world to everybody. And uh, I don't want to overlook another young man that uh, helped me when I came back to Conroe get started here, one of your board members, Mr. Scott Kidd. Uh, Scott was one of my outstanding students. He made me a better Pee Wee football coach than I really was. <laughs> and Scott, thank you very much. Tonight's award is honoring a special school, a great school district, uh, and a great lady in Imogen Giesinger. And uh, part of the 51 years that I make reference to is uh, we knew the Giesinger family personally, and I went to school with her children. Uh, so there's a special tie here, and Dr. Stockton, when you brought this to me, uh, it warmed my heart, so thank you. It means a lot to me personally also, as well as the school. And if I might share this with you, please, and it reads, whereas 
Giesinger Elementary School was one of 25 Texas schools recognized by U.S. Secretary of Education Ann Duncan on Tuesday, September the 30th, 2014, as a National Blue Ribbon School for 2014. And whereas the National Blue Ribbon Schools program honors public and private elementary, middle, and high schools where students either achieve very high learning standards or are making notable improvements in closing the achievement gap. And whereas this award affirms the hard work of students, educators, families, and communities in creating safe and welcoming schools when students master challenging content, and whereas the mayor and city council, along with the Conroe Independent School District, wish to recognize the students and educators for this outstanding and hard-won achievement. Now, therefore, I, Webb Melder, Mayor of the City of Conroe, Texas, do hereby extend to Giesinger Elementary School the City Council's heartfelt appreciation and admiration for their commitment and devotion to the education of our future generations and urge all citizens of Conroe to recognize the teachers and students for this outstanding and exceptional award. Witness my hand and seal of office, October 21, Webb Melder, Mayor. Thank you. Of course, there is one more vital criteria to a National Blue Ribbon School, and that's an outstanding leader. Mrs. Page has been an educator for 33 years and a principal for 16 years in the Conroe Independent School District. She has been principal at B.B. Rice Elementary, Reeves, and Giesinger Elementaries. Under her leadership, Giesinger Elementary was recognized as a Title I Part A Distinguished Schools for four consecutive years. Further, Mrs. Page has received principal of a Distinguished Title I School Award for both Reeves and Giesinger Elementary. Mrs. Page is a gifted leader who produces high, acad high academic results in any school environment. And we would like to invite you up to receive this recognition. <laughs> Becky Page. President Sanders, member of the school board, and Dr. Stockton. Receiving a National Blue Ribbon Award is a great honor for our community, our school district, and our school. The support from our school board, central administration staff, our community, parents, students, and teachers is instrumental in achieving this honor. I grew up in Conroe. I attended Conroe ISD schools, and I love working in Conroe ISD. I'm excited to have this recognition for Conroe ISD, our school, and our community for what we do. At this time, I'd like to introduce the staff from Giesinger Elementary. They're talented, educated teachers and very talented who love children and believe that all means all. I appreciate the family members who have supported our staff here tonight. Our family support and the teachers desire to be the best that we can be ensure that great instruction happens every day on our campus. So if they would stand up, please. You know, every year at the beginning of the year, Dr. Stockton uh, begins our year reading to our staff a book. And every year at Giesinger, we begin the year reading a book. And we read about our fine, fine school and our fine, fine teachers and our fine, fine students. Thank you.
<laughs> and Mrs. Page, I just have a few words to say on behalf of the board. Uh, you know, Conroe ISD has some great schools, don't we? And now we get to add a Blue Ribbon School to that. And we are so thankful for you and your staff and what you have done for not only this district, but for the students that you serve each and every day. You're there with smiling faces, welcoming those students in, making sure that you've created a community of learning. And that's really what I believe the Blue Ribbon Award is about, is creating that community of learning. And you have uh, achieved, and we just want to say we're very proud of you and your staff for all you've done. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. And you are welcome to stay all night. We're very proud of you. Or you don't have to. Thank you. We appreciate everything that you do. Thank you so much. Yeah. I got a few papers to grade. Yeah. <laughs> well, if that don't just make you proud. Thank you. She's married. She's not in town. All right. Item number 2C, citizens' participation. Miss Ferris? She's not no, here tonight. Not this here. is Gladys. Stick with me. There is no one who signed up to. All right. Thank you so much. We'll continue on then. Item three, consent agenda. Is there any item that wish uh, any board member wishes to pull? If not, then is there a motion to approve? Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor and all those opposed? And the motion carries. No, go ahead. All right. Item 4A, Texas Accountability Summary, Dr. Stockton. Yeah, I'll ask Dr. Hines to come up and present uh, this annual report. Good evening, President Sanders, members of the board, Dr. Stockton. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be able to present tonight uh, our annual uh, report. Uh, it's hard to it's a hard act to follow after that, uh, but it is uh, certainly an exciting night. The, um, for your information, I'm going to present a summary of our accountability, our uh, SAT, ACT scores, our advanced placement uh, summary, as well as TELPASS results for 2014. And before I get started, though, I do want to uh, uh, recognize uh, the team that I'm so fortunate to be able to work with that helped compile the information from various reports. Uh, there's a lot of information. The full report is going to be up on the website uh, tomorrow morning, um, as well as uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint, which is just the highlights of the report. And I do want to take a minute to recognize some really special folks that helped make this happen. Uh, Veronica Martin, our college readiness specialist, if you're here, if you'll just stand up so we can all see you. There's Veronica right there. Dr. Curtis Knoll, Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education. Edith Upshaw, Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Sherry Sunderman, our coordinator of guidance and counseling, and we all need guidance, don't we? Uh, Debbie McNeely, our coordinator of advanced academic programs. Julie English, our director of assessment and evaluation. Darren Carlisle, our coordinator for bilingual and ESL education programs is with us this evening. And Greg Ship, our CTE coordinator. And so uh, we really have a lot of folks that help put this information together. <laughs> They are, to steal a line from Tennyson, the uh, goodliest fellowship of night, nights where this world holds records. So it is an honor to work with them. Um, it, so I'll, I'll take you through just some of the highlights. Um, every year, I know I have to explain TELPASS. It's part of the NCLB accountability system for our English language learners. And we must show annual increases in our progress. 
and the goal in Texas is for all of our uh, ELL students to make at least one proficiency level of progress each year. Uh, we talk about ELPS. ELPS are, um, are the instructional standards designed to ensure that our English language learners are taught the academic English they need for school purposes. And as we know, our, our students are acquiring English and they're also having to take very difficult assessments along the way. TELPASS is the federally required assessment program designed to measure the annual progress that our English language learners make in learning this academic uh, English. And we, to do that, we also have to have a rating system. And these are our teachers that are trained to assess our ELLs for TELPASS. And the short of it is, um, the ELPS are used as the foundation and enrichment of instruction for our K through 12 English language learners. And we're assessing four language areas, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And they're using four levels, beginning, intermediate, advanced, and advanced high. And I won't do all the descriptors, but, but you get the idea. Beginning is very little English, and advanced high is great appropriate with minimal second language acquisition. And then eventually our students that are successful will exit the program and are no longer taking TELPASS. Who takes it? It's any of our students that are identified as English language learners, not just those who opt into bilingual, but it's anyone that's identified. So uh, when we do this, uh, and they're assessed annually. It uses an online multiple choice test to assess students in readings in grades 2 through 12, and it uses a holistic rating process in classroom performance to assess uh, listening, speaking, and writing in all the grade levels and the reading at K-1. Now last year they changed up uh, the standards and so uh, just to give you a quick overview, the weights changed. So for example, reading used to be 75% of the weight, now it's 50% and writing doubled from 15 to 30%, listening doubled and speaking doubled. And in addition, the score ranges were adjusted and modified. Uh, so that also is an impact. And because it impacted, it really reset the scoring system. So I don't have anything to compare to say, well, this is how we did compared to last year. This will be a beginning of a new uh, comparison. But these are our results, um, and, without, and these are percentiles. So as you might imagine, we had 57 percent of our kindergartners were at the beginning stage, um, and it changes. And the idea is that. Uh, what's really important is that our students are moving one, two, or more levels each year in exiting the program. And it's also, I have to say, is it's a fluid uh, group of students because we have students leaving and entering all the time in all grade levels. So I just wanted to pass that on. Next year we'll have a lot more information to show in terms of how we, how we did in moving students. I want to uh, transition now into the accountability rating system. I'll mention the district. Uh, rating system tonight and how we did. Uh, I know next month you'll get some more information about specific campuses and so I'll, I won't go into that information tonight. Uh, I know last year we confused you thoroughly and uh, I'm hopefully we won't confuse you as much tonight. But there's four, to, to, to kind of summarize, there's four indices and what I'll do is try to give you a quick summary. The short of it is the district met standards. So that's the, the short answer is we met standards. That's that green bar. And there's really two, two ratings. You met standard or improvements required. So we met standard. That's a good thing. Uh, and we'll talk about it. As you can see, there's a performance index summary. There's some distinction designations we'll talk about. And there's even some system safeguards. But I'll start with the four indices that make up the performance index report, starting with index one. Index one is the simplest one to understand. It's basically all of the tests, out of all the tests we gave, what percentage of students passed at the phase in level two standard or at our current level two standard. And that's gonna change in a few years. And next year it actually goes to a new one. So it includes reading, math, writing, science, and social studies, and it's all students. Phase in level two. We had 87%. And so we get points. And that's really a point system, and so sometimes it's not a percentage, it's a point system, and we had 87 points, but that's really the percentage of our students that passed. How did we do compared to the state? Just to give you a um, kind of a benchmark or a context, 
77 was the state score. And to not be an improvement required, we had to have at least a 55. And I'll point out, there's four indices. If you miss any one of the four, you're an improvement required. So it's not three out of four, or it's not two out of, it's any one. If you don't make it in any of the four, we're an improvement required. Index two is student progress. And this is the index that's really much based on how a student did in a prior year in the same subject compared to this year. Did they make what the state felt like was a progress that they should have made? So the state uses scale scores to kind of set a, a point and they think, well, this is how they did in third grade reading and fourth grade reading to make progress. We expect them to make at least this score. If that makes sense. It varies from test to test. It varies from grade level to grade level. That's really what index two is about. Did we move students? And you can get points even if a student failed. If they grew, you get points. And you either get a point for meeting growth, you can even get two points for exceeding the growth. Uh, and that's how this one is assessed. So index two is about student progress. And there, because index two is um, different depending on the schools and which tests they give, uh, for example, this last year, high schools weren't rated because they changed the English test. So they didn't have anything to compare it to. So they didn't get a rating in index two. But middle schools had to have a 28, elementary schools a minimum of 33, and the district had to have at least a 16 to meet the index two requirement. We had a 44, and to put it in perspective, the state had a 40. So, okay, yes, sir. Just a quick question to make sure I understand. The 87 or the 44, depending on which slide you're talking about, or is that a percentage of? It's it's a point system. It's a point system, and it's based on you can get more than one point. So we have students that get that passed and did not meet progress, and they get zero points. We have students that score real high that didn't meet progress. If they're already fours, they can't go anywhere else or whatever. Correct. Now I will say to get to a certain score like a 95 or above, they just give it to you automatically. Okay. We have students that have made. A 91 one year, make an 89 the next year, and they didn't get, they got zero points. Okay. So you get, it's, and then I can earn two points if I exceeded progress. But what does this mean by districts 16? Well, that was what we had to have in order to not be improvement required. Appreciate it. Sorry. So we had to have a 16, we hit a 44. Yellow line. Sorry. Great question. I got it. No, I got it. great question. Index three is the one for closing the performance gaps. And this is really an index designed to make sure that we're, we're moving all of our students. So this one is held for all of our students that are, that are identified as economically disadvantaged, as well as the two lower, lowest groups by race or ethnicity from the prior year. So those groups are identified, and they're tracked the next year to see, did you move? Did you, did you go up or did you go down? Move against the other groups or move? Move against their own performance in the okay. prior year. Right. And uh, so if I had, you know, 75% of my economically disadvantaged students passed it the, the fourth grade reading this year, what percentage passed it this next year? Won't be the same students, but it's the same group. Same group. And for the district, we received 45. The state was a 38, and the target was a 28. How was this targets determined? I mean, it, it seems like both our district and the state we're, we're did Julie, better than they just make target, it so. Yeah, I, do you know how they established that? This is Julie English, our Director of Assessment Evaluation. That's established by taking a look at how the, the, the schools across the state I know an index two. But even the state the did above the target. That's what I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm. well, so this is this is nationwide though. State yeah, state, 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 state average. Statewide. So I, I you know I know in index two it's they set it at the bottom five percent. Well first of all it's part of it is part of no child left behind. And so it's I understand these are state averages, but the, the target score is nationwide. It's state because, you know, and that's a great question. It's statewide. It, the state of Texas, when we redid the accountability system, we did align it to meet the NCLB requirements. Okay. But each state may have a different assessment system. And so Texas 
has a unique system. We're the only ones who give the star test. We're the only ones who do what we do. And so you really can't compare it to everybody else. It's really a in-state. And as unlike normal, when, when you're closing performance gaps, you're closing gaps. Here, you're saying that's not at all what this is. This is performance versus last year, different group of students. But it is closing it. They want to look at, are you closing the gap? I, if you're not measuring against somebody else, Chris, how can we even bet? Yeah. I, I, doc, I'm sorry, Dr. Hines. How can it? How can it be? How can you be closing? How can you know if you're closing a gap if you're not measuring it against another either group, albeit you know whatever? I would say for us as a district, I know we're doing that. It is because the fourth graders went to fifth grade and they're still in our district. The fifth graders went to sixth grade and they're still in our district. So for us, a large portion of those students are being compared from year to year because our total groups are district wide. It's all the kids district wide. So us more than the campuses really is, you know, a high percentage of our students are going to be compared because we, our fifth graders are now our sixth graders and our eighth graders are now our ninth graders. I, I you know, guess, I guess what I'm saying is when, when I understand you're closing performance graph, gaps, it's, for example, between uh, one either ethnicity or, or socioeconomic group and another, okay? Well, here, that's not at all. That's not the measure, and that's closing a performance gap between those groups. Not not between right. one set of fourth graders versus the next year fifth graders, or vice versa, or whatever, or the uh, or the upcoming fourth graders. That, that doesn't make any, it doesn't have to make sense. I understand. I, I still it should make it. sense. But you probably should take those sorts of concerns to the state board of education, since they seem to not understand that we are confused by this. So it's very confusing for everybody. I'm always, thank you. And I, I'm always proud that, you know, we outdo the state and, and it, you know, the state outdid their, their own. I don't know how you do that. How's the state outdo it? Anyway, you know, anyway, we can move on now. John's just, the, the, no, I'm, I'm good. Be, well, I've got a question. Yes, sir. <laughs> because if I understand, how did you get the target? We don't. The state sets the target. Okay, but what, then you. But I thought you said it based on the lower something for. Today. I said in index two. I know it's based on the bottom five percent. Index That's, three is as well. In index three is as well. So they, the state looks at every. puts all the districts on a continuum. And then sets a target after the thing. Yes. Done? And then draws a line and says, "Here's the target." That right. sounds, Even that sounds that's like the test. It's just like reading on paper. Well, no, it's like the peanuts character where you shoot the arrow and it falls in the ground, then you draw the target. So you. Yeah, we were speaking earlier about Miss Geesinger. She never let me grade my own test. <laughs> okay, never mind. Okay. It, the state, the state, the state, the state, nice the state number better. is the average for the yeah. state. Yeah, and, and Chris, we do understand that you know you're not just trying to be up to. I mean, this is just up to, okay. I mean, it's not you. We understand that. Let me just clarify that you were, you were Miss English. Either. Okay, can I add something? Yes, okay, absolutely. so taking a look at closing the performance gaps, what the state wants to know is taking a look at the the groups that we that may not have. Those particular groups who may not have performed as well as other groups, are we paying attention to those groups? So are we closing the gap within that group? Within Does that, make that sense? one group? Within that group. That's the group. Not against another not group. Not against another group. Because we say, do because also are interested in that, right? But they were identified because of their separation from the from the Okay. All right. Thank you. For does that make sense? Yes, or it does. You, you, you clarified something for me. Okay. Within that group, I got okay. that. But, okay. But a group doesn't always mean just that grade. It could mean individual students? Yeah. No. no. You're talking about just a grade then. A group means a grade. It means a school campus group. Oh, a school Every, campus. So everybody in my group, if, if I'm a school that serves and I've tested third and fourth graders, Every student that is identified as economically disadvantaged right. will be in that group, and it'll be added together, third and fourth grade. Well, okay. Right, and the state wants to make sure that the economically disadvantaged kids that we're that we're watching those kids and we're moving them. Sure, but wouldn't doesn't it make more sense to move them against another group that is outperforming them, closing the gap? Right, not not down, but up. Well, in a sense, in a sense, they kind of—I guess they are because you're I don't looking understand. to see which ones perform lower than the others. I, I understand what you said, <laughs> but within the group, you're not closing a gap; you're only closing that group's gap, and that's 
That's measuring them against them. Mm -hmm. uh, just never mind. <laughs> in the <laughs> moving right along. In the fourth, in the, <laughs> this is as good as last year. <laughs> I apologize. We care. I mean, we care. That's we all I'm trying care. to say. It, it, no, I, and I, <clears throat> index four is the post-secondary readiness index, and this in this index, it's for the high schools. It's a little more complicated because they'll include the graduation rates, which are based on the the federal percentages, as well as the percentage of students that graduate under the recommended plan or the distinguished achievement plan, which is, as you know, going to phase out as, right. with, as the students move forward. And also, we look at the STAR score. And for the other schools that don't have, like, for example, the non-high schools, it's just going to be the STAR scores. And for the STAR scores, they're looking at the students who met the final level two, not the current phase-in score, but the final, what you're going to have to have to pass a few years from now. How many did that? How many students did that on two or more tests? And if a student only took one test, then they're just scored on how they did on that one test. But if they took two or more, that's what you had to do to meet, to get points in this indicator. And this is an indicator designed to say, hey, we think these students are on track to be ready for post-secondary education. That's what this is intended for. So are they scoring at a high level on multiple tests? That's how they're looking at it. And the target score was 57. We had a 77, and the state average was a 69. And just to kind of give a context. So um, that's how we did on the four indices, which, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, that's what would decide if we were improvement required. Now, the state also has another system called system safeguards. And this system is put in really to disaggregate performance by student group in each area. And I just mentioned, for example, in index three, that it's two lowest student groups. Well, this one does every group, including ELL, special education, every ethnicity, every group is calculated and looked at. And there's calculated and looked at in two areas, performance and participation. And then we also are looking at graduation rates and all the group. Last year, we didn't make it in one of the safeguards in special education graduation. And that was one of those that we had a really hard time because some of our students that didn't count were actually arted to stay in high school multiple years. And so it was really frustrating. Um, and the federal limit on the use of alternative assessments, which is the alternative test. So they actually will give you a ding if you exceed their uh, cap on that. So the system safeguards. We had 100%, which is very difficult to do. And I don't, I, and next year, don't, I don't know that I'll be up here saying we did it again, because it's hard. But we had 100%. To put it in perspective, I want to give you a context. This is how districts around us did in that area. And you can see we were the only district in our area that hit 100% on the system safeguards, and we're really proud of that because mm -hmm. it, is, it is difficult to do. That's a big deal. From That's, a yeah. That's a huge deal. That's a big deal. Yeah. Light should go off. Yeah. The question about all of the system, I can assure you that regardless of um, how it's being interpreted, every single student is important. Every Absolutely. single Absolutely. student. Everybody counts. Then the fourth area we mentioned is the, uh, is the campus distinction designations, which is um, that schools can get recognition for doing well in certain areas. And, and possible distinctions include, are you in the, the schools are grouped. And it's really, it's really kind of a unique system. They, we, we, each school is set up as a group of 40 schools based on demographic characteristics that are supposedly like that. And these 40 schools you're compared to, and if you're in the top 25% in student progress, you can get, and that's, did you move your students? That gets a distinction. If you're in the top 25%, that'd be the top 10 of your comparison group with closing the achievement gaps, you would be eligible for a distinction. If you uh, achieved in the top 10% of the, in the top 10 or the top 25% in post-secondary readiness, you would get a distinction. And then they also have a distinction for the tested subjects of reading and English, uh, math, and social studies, and science. And there's, for elementaries, it's you have to have uh, the top quartile on 50% of the measures. And each one of these areas has multiple measures. So there's, a lot, there's lots of little areas where you could be uh, not make it or make it. 
And then for the high schools, they're set at, they have to have a third because the high schools have more measures because they have SAT, ACT, advanced placement. So there's several measures. So to make it, it's not that easy. Uh, roughly, you know, it's basically a quarter would make it if you just had a random distribution. Um, and for our district, we had 38% of the eligible distinctions were earned, which put it in perspective, we looked at what are the districts around us, how they do in terms of earning distinctions. So this gives you an idea that we did very well compared to our comparison districts and how we uh, did on distinctions. We always want to do better on this, and I will tell you, our goal is to get as many as we can get. We want to, we want to perform, and we want to perform better than our peers. And so that's our goal. Um, but this is how we did last year, and it's, again, a moving target. We'll see how we do next year. So that was the campus. So I'm going to segue out of accountability into uh, the college uh, readiness indicators in terms of what we do. National merit competition, I'll just quickly mention, we had uh, 31 uh, semifinalists this year. And I think next month, Dr. Noel present those recipients at, at the next month's board meeting. So we're excited about that. 31 is a good class. Uh, also, I'll share with you how do we do on graduation rate this year. And uh, again, there's many different things that are calculated, but the state primarily uses a report based on a cohort. And so this is always behind because it takes a while to get the data. But based on the class of 2013, when they started together four years before that, what percentage graduated four years later? What percentage got, received a GED? Which percentage continued high school or were still enrolled in that fifth year? Or which percentage of students dropped out? And so for us, we're the dark blue and the light blue is the state. Just to put it in comparison, we had 95.1% of our students graduate compared to 88% at the state level. 1.1% of our students received a GED compared to 0.8%. 2.3% of our students were continued or enrolled again for a fifth year compared to the 4.6 at the state level. And 1.5% of our students dropped out or were unaccounted for compared to 6.6% at the state level. Again, just a quick look at the trend where the uh, light blue line and the dark blue line is the state average. And you can see over the last 12 years that we've made some progress in terms of moving uh, from about 88% to 95%. And we've been pretty constant in that area the last few years. Uh, we're still working on that. We want to get better. And again, every student counts. Looking at graduation plans, which has a lot to do with the rigor and how well our students are prepared for things like the PSAT or the SAT or the ACT. And it's one of the things that, that, that is measured in index four um, for 2013 class. 82% of our students were in the recommended plan, 10.69% were in the distinguished achievement plan, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we're in the uh, minimum plan, and 7.3% were in the distinguished achievement plan, which is the blue at the bottom. So the blue is the, the DAP, the red is the recommended, and the green is the minimum plan. And you can see over the years, uh, we were able to shrink that percentage down. And uh, in, is that the, the new programs or are they not in effect for this year? Not, not in effect. Just making sure. Yes. So this is all going to change again? Yes, sir. Okay. So nothing to compare. Yeah, then we'll just be on a new start over. So when are we going to start it? Freshman, current freshmen. Current freshmen, so yeah. we still have two years. <laughs> SAT, um, looking at the SAT scores, we had a, a combined three test average of uh, 1567. That's up five points from last year. And Texas had a combined 1435, and the national was 1497. And this is another test that's going to change in uh, January of 16. I think it's going to change. SAT is going to change again. And I think writing is going to become optional at that point. So there'll be some changes coming down the road. But we had a 523 in reading, a 541 in math, and 503 in writing. And just to look at our trend, we like to look at trends. And we have, if you remember, writing hasn't been around that long. It's been about six, seven years maybe. And um, so we've been tracking the combined reading and math for several years. And this is kind of a look back over since 95, 96 to see how we're trending. And you can see we're generally trending. We've, we've had our ups and downs. We like to look at that. We're, we're, we're generally trending up a little bit right now. 
but when you look at the national, it's pretty flat, and the state is actually going down. So we're kind of uh, doing all right compared to the other trends. Our number of two students tested was 2,202, and that's a positive jump. Now, is, is that low spot of in 2008-9, the 15-15, does that coincide with that, with that uh, uh, drop in performance as well? I, if I'm trying to remember if that was the year right, right, it came right. Out. I'm, I'm trying to think why why would did why did the state and and, and our performance drop that year uh, right here? Yeah, and that, it looks like it wasn't until 11 or 12, maybe 10 or 11, right. something like that. Yeah, and I and I really I, I'm, I'd have to go back and look. There was one year we saw a big drop off with the, when the year the writing test came out. Mm -hmm. We right. saw a big drop off mm -hmm. in participation on the SAT, and then I know there's been a couple of cor corrections they've done with the test here and there. And that's is why I used to look at Is this it. reflecting participation or score? That's the score. This is the participation. But one of those years, one of those years, it was either the five, six year or the eight, nine, is when writing came out. I don't have it with me. Okay. Thank you. I, 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 see, I see. This is participation. Okay, thanks. So this is the number of students participating, yeah. take, actually taking a test. Versus the score. Yeah, you may want to look at that as, as a percentage taking into account the growth of the district does the same uh, mm -hmm. stair step there. It really doesn't tell us much. It's been, yeah, it's been interesting in terms of we do look at that as well. And you're right, most of the growth, we've gone up a little bit, but not as much as the number of participation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm trying to remember to go back and look. You know, typical, our typical graduating classes grow, but not as fast as we'd like. Let's put it that way. Okay. <clears throat> CISD composite and ACT was a 23.5. That's up from a 23.3 with 1,290 students participating in last year's assessment. And you can see the where, where the green bars compared to Texas is the red and the national scores are in blue, just to give you a context of how we did. Um, we actually went up a little bit. ACT also calculates based on performance and all the and, and if you in each index if you hit a certain score they will say well you're college ready based on that score and so we always track that and this is just the percentage of students that actually met it in all four of the subjects and we had 43 percent uh, that met it in all four just compared to the state of 26 so it's been interesting to watch that trend. And again, this is just another look at the subject trend for the district. And the, uh, the red is the, the one that jumps up is the math uh, score. And then the, the, uh, the black column is the composite. Switching gears from SAT and ACT, which are the two college entrance exams, to advanced placement. Those are the tests that students take to get that make them eligible for college credit, but they're based on courses that they take in high school. Uh, this last year, we had 8,009 student uh, nine tests taken by 3,633 students. And again, this gives you kind of a projection of, uh, and, and during that time, we have grown. Um, we haven't grown that fast. So we've, we've actually added tests and test takers much faster than we've grown. Chris, uh, we, we all agree that it's, it, even if they don't pass, it is prepping them the college readiness. Yes, okay. sir. But why don't we ever hear of those 8,009 tests taken? How many did make a three to a five? I mean, that would be an interesting number for me to know year to year. And it's, it's, it's in the full report. Actually, we give a percentage. It, it is just in the full report. And, and this is our mean score, just to give you that. Uh, the mean score for us was 2.92. And a three is generally considered right. passing. It's, yeah, it varies from college credit. to college. And, major to major, but it, 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 it generally we did well, 2.92 compared to the... Isn't there a change going to go into effect too that I think it depended on the university as to whether or not they would give them credit if they had a three or a four, but I thought that there was a change that was to be made. It already makes a difference about which college, yeah. what you say, which yeah, college. Yeah, you, you, the university you know, must give them too. credit if they make above... I thought it was a four. It may, it may not be. I don't Thank know. You, you I don't, I'm looking at Sherry. Yeah, I was going to say Sherry. I'm not sure. It still varies. Okay. And it's okay. 
Ah, uh, okay, okay. Thank you for that There has been some discussion, and I, I think in the graduation plans that students could, could exempt taking the STAR test with a three on the AP test, I believe. And I think that's coming in. Or a certain SAT score. <laughs> I know we always get that question of which test do our students take, and these are the top 14. Uh, social studies as a subject dominates the test category, but you can see U.S. history was tops, world history second, government, English language composition, which is junior level, psychology, human geography, uh, statistics, English literature, which is the senior level course, macroeconomic, Spanish language, biology, calculus, environmental science, and then chemistry. Switching gears to dual credit, uh, we, we obviously have students who take classes for college credit during their high school uh, credit as well. And this year, right now, we have 2,026 courses which students are enrolled in. Um, and, it, and it varies from school to school. Uh, it's always going to be based on instructor availability, scheduling, and some other factors. Um, but you can see English, the, the composition <clears throat> or the junior level course is the highest participation followed by the senior and then the U.S. history and college algebra. And just we just when you look at fall enrollment trends over the last few years, we've, we're up a little bit. Uh, it's been fairly, uh, fairly s s stable. Uh, it goes up and down a little bit, but, but it's back up this year. And that there's usually a relationship with AP. So the more students who take dual credit, if they've already got credit, they're not going to sign up for an AP test and so on. So we know that there's a little bit of give and take there. We also have students that, that take other courses at Lone Star College, which we offer workforce program, programs or certificate programs. And currently this year we have 10 students that are enrolled in welding, 15 in the phlebotomy class, and four in the computer numeric controls. And those are uh, taken at the Conroe location. And we've had this question, what kind of certificates do our students earn in high school? Last year we had 886 uh, certificates that were earned by students in our career and technology education courses. And uh, there's a variety, I won't read them all, but we have some to do with uh, working, there's a canine care, there's AutoCAD, there's some welding certification, uh, some, some floral design, uh, several in the automotive areas that our students earn the certifications. Do, do, do we have one for, um, for the uh, culinary? Which, which, there's some certifications. 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 Okay. Thank you. Just put a plug in. We actually have a career expo coming up on November the 6th at the Lone Star Convention Center. And this is really for all of our students that, that we invite to come out. And it gives uh, employers in the area an opportunity to come out and for our students to learn about their jobs, what their jobs, what their needs are, uh, what they're looking for, and what kind of potential careers are out there in hopes to guide students into being you know, a little bit more selective about which type of programs they may want to go in. So that's coming up on November the 6th from 6 to 8 at the Lone Star Convention Center. We survey our seniors every year and they report and they can give us more than one answer so it won't add to 100. Um, but 59% reported they were going to go to a four-year college. 27% said they would go to a two-year college. And of course, our number one destination for students to go to college is Lone Star College, Montgomery. And, uh, the, uh, but this one is interesting. 15% reported they would go to vocational or technical school training, which is way up for us. And that's, that's an interesting trend. So we'll be watching that. 7% said they were going to go to work full-time. 6% said part-time. 3% uh, to the military. And then three percent said other. What do you attribute that, that spike to? Is that we're preparing them more so for, or providing more options as relates to? You know, it, it's. <coughs> I think there is a growing awareness about high-paying jobs uh -huh. in skilled.
fields, and I think yeah. there are more people that are starting to really be more aware that this might be an area I want to go into. It doesn't require a degree, but it does require additional training. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you find it alarming that we only have, was it 20 kids? I can't remember the numbers, 4 and 15 and whatever, uh, in those three. Uh, I, it's, that, 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 those are high need areas, and I understand the frustration. I think one of the things we've we've learned is that it's it's not centrally located for students to yeah. get to, and a lot of students do not like leaving school to go to these programs because it does limit your options. I might not be able to play sports, or I might not be able to be in certain activities, and it really is it that is one of the limitations to busing students over to the Conroe facility to take computer numeric controls or phlebotomy, there probably were students who were interested in that program but just can't give up that chunk of time or, or willing to cut out other things. Well, do you remember the, uh, do you remember, I'm sorry, they, you, you, you were doing it. When it used to be like first and second period or whatever, they, they would they would bus the uh, uh, Candy Creek students, and they may still do it, I'm not sure. To, to the academy here at Conroe. It seems like to me, you know, I mean, sports and band and other things take place, you know, after school. Could it be a timing issue that we could work out with uh, with the, maybe that's not a fair question, and, and we need to go into it tonight. I'm sorry. We, no, that's we, okay. And it, we, are, we are working on that. It is something that's been an ongoing dialogue. I just know we got into those programs. Let's let, let given the time slot. Let's, let's let it slide. Well, I do want to add this though. I, I do think with House Bill Five, the kids will have more flexibility to do that. Yeah, they got that. I, I, I think, I think we're them. we're springboarding into that. Great. And that has been a limitation. How many classes yep. can I fit? And these were a minimum of two periods, and sometimes more if I'm traveling, right. so giving up time to go back and forth. And that's a big. Yeah. We're working real hard throughout the system to make kids aware of different opportunities and. In the various endorsements, and many of those we talked about today, um, our career fair is, is going to be. It, it grows every year, and um, in fact, at the chamber, Conroe Chamber retreat, we're going to spend an afternoon talking about workforce readiness. In fact, Mr. Ship's going to um, present to the to the business community. So, really try and activate the, the business community. The other thing that we're trying to do is have that dialogue with parents. We're going to do that same thing with PTA PTO presidents here next week. Um, because we need to talk about those opportunities for kids so that parents can start thinking about them early on. So I think we're building good momentum to really booster those numbers. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Appreciate you. We know you're working hard, Mr. Ship. I mean, yes, sir. Uh, Did you have anything to add? Well, we, we, uh, we certainly did this with Lone Star about Thank you, Mr. Ship. By the way, is is up for um, a, a year ago? He was here for the um, state award for oh, yes. um, CTE. I, I'm going to make this title up, Greg, Educator of the Year. And he's up for the national in the national competition coming up here pretty soon. So we wish you the best of luck on that. Well, just Absolutely. congratulations for being considered, sir. Yeah. All right, uh, four-year universities. I mentioned that the Lone Star College is our primary des or our, our largest destination, but when we looked at the four-year universities as reported to us by the universities themselves, uh, this is where we were with the class of 2013. You can see Texas A&M was the number one destination. It's been that way the last several years. Uh, UT Austin was number two, and Sam Houston State uh, right in there at number three. And then from there it gets it gets kind of leveled out. We have Texas State University and Texas Tech, U of H, uh, Baylor, and uh, UTSA are popular options. So uh, we're, we're ahead of them. If you had them, up, we're kind of like uh, Ed. I'd like just to make a quick comment. Um, um, and I guess I want to say this to your whole team and, and all the individuals that were recognized tonight. Uh, from the board, we want to say just an incredible big thank you. Uh, I know in our community, uh, expectations are so high, and, and I think sometimes we look at these scores and we see, oh, we're up, but we don't really 
express how appreciative we are of your whole team of what y'all do because you know we can be in an, another district where where it's not that high and uh, I just wanted to say thank you to all of y'all I know you work very hard and I, I know you know so much goes and goes on in the classroom for our students uh, but you guys are the captains that are driving the ship and and uh, I just wanted to you know when you look at stuff like this and see where we're rating no matter what the you know, it's the best system we have. It, no matter what the ratings are, we're way up there, and that's not to be taken for granted. And I know there's a lot of pressure in our community, and I just wanted to say again, I applaud y'all. Our board applauds you, and we thank you for doing such a great job. Here, here, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. Well said. Thank you, Dr. Hyde. Thank you, and um, thanks for that recognition for outstanding. We have great teachers, yeah. great students, and, and, and great leadership on our campus that really and they all want to get better, so thank you. Yeah, there are great things happening in our classrooms every day. You know, we say every day, every classroom. Um, and, and they do great things and continue to get better, and we're here to support them. There you go. Absolutely. Okay. All right, item 4B. Thank you, everybody. Great job. Uh, approval of the 2014-15 District Improvement Plan, um, Dr. Hines. All right, I'm going to be two in a row. I get a doubleheader right here. Lines, all right. All right. Night. Uh, oh my God! President Sanders, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, uh, I am here to request your approval of the district improvement plan. Uh, the district has a plan that is developed and evalu evaluated and revised annually uh, by uh, the superintendent with the assistance of our district level committee. The purpose of the plan is to guide the district and campus staff in the improvement of student performance for all student groups in order to attain state standards in respect to the Texas Accountability System indicators. And the district improvement plan has to include provisions for many things. I'll just hit a few, uh, a comprehensive needs assessment. And we've heard a lot of the data tonight. I mean, we look at this and we want to get better. And so we're looking at how do we can get better, measurable district performance objectives for all appropriate academic excellence indicators for all student populations, strategies for improvement for student in, uh, uh, performance that includes what are the methods, um, how are we going to meet their needs? How are we going to work on dropout reduction? How are we going to use technology, uh, discipline and behavior management, uh, staff development for our staff, uh, career education, accelerated education. We also have programs to uh, promote scholarships awareness and program awareness. Also, we have to identify the resources, who's responsible, timelines, and what we'll use to evaluate along the way, our formative evaluations along the way. Uh, it's a work in progress. It's post. It'll be posted on our website. It's, it is a document that could change, and we use it as a working document. So um, I know you're approving it, but you're approving a working document. I just wanted you to know that. Is there a motion? So moved. I think motion and second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor and all those opposed, motion carries. Thank you. And Dr. item 4C is approval of the 2014-15 campus improvement plans. Dr. Nell and Dr. Gibson, if you'll present that item. All right, good evening once again. The site-based decision-making committee of each campus annually assists the principal in developing, reviewing, and revising the campus improvement plan for the purpose of improving student performance for all student populations with respect to the state accountability system. The campus improvement plans are also aligned with the district improvement plan. These plans have been submitted and thoroughly reviewed by the Curriculum and Instruction Department and, then, and have been available electronically for your review over the past two weeks. The plans are living documents that will be continuously referred to, monitored, and amended as the school year progresses. At this time, we seek your approval of the 2014-2015 campus improvement plans. So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor? And all those opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say, you know, I'm, I used to be on those site-based committees, and, and, and so did probably most of the people sitting here. And just because we approve them without a lot of discussion, those individual campuses know what they need to do with your help and your leadership and guidance. I mean, those plans are great, but I mean, what, I mean, I just didn't want it to go by without, there's a lot of work put into those, the district plan as well. And, and it doesn't go ignored. It's just too voluminous to, 
to brag about every every sentence that's good news. So I, I just wanted to tell y'all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that respect as well. Thank you, Mr. A lot of work. Good, yeah. good comment. All right, item four, administration, capital improvements update. Dr. Stockton. Well, easy Foster, if you'll please present that item. Yes, President Sanders, Dr. Stockton, members of the board, it's my pleasure to give you an update on our capital improvements, which are construction projects in progress within the district. I'm going to start with the Oak Ridge High School ninth grade campus. Uh, this project is approximately 25% complete. It's scheduled to be 100% complete for uh, school next next school year. So we're looking at here are the uh, steel structure for the admin uh, changes to that building. That building gets a new front door as part of this part of this addition. What we're looking at here are the uh, structure getting ready to go in place for the cafeteria expansion for the additional student population we're experiencing at the Oak Ridge uh, complex. Uh, now we're looking at the uh, building slab for the classroom, the culinary lab, and the art labs that are that are to be built as part of this expansion as well. On the other end of the building, uh, at the end of this week, you would actually start seeing concrete on the ground. These are the new science labs that are being added to the science portion of this building as well. At Bogle Intermediate, uh, this project is actually ahead of schedule. It was scheduled to turn over uh, approximately spring break. It is now on target to turn over at the Christmas break, so we're working with purchasing technology to make sure we get the furniture uh, and the equipment necessary to use that for the spring semester. Looking at now, you can see finishes, uh, the mechanical systems, uh, things like of that nature going going in place as we speak. Uh, the brickwork on the building, this is a classroom addition. The brickwork is in progress and is uh, matching very well with the with the existing building. The uh, there's not a slide for our LED project. The LED project is the last project that is in uh, underway uh, in midstream. Uh, that project is on schedule. Uh, as you'll recall, we've purchased approximately 15,000 light fixtures. Uh, at this point, we've installed just over 11,000 light fixtures at uh, the Woodlands High School, Connor High School, Connor High Ninth Grade, uh, and Oak Ridge Elementary. The, the crews are currently working through Cane Creek High School. When they finish Cane Creek High School, they'll be moving to McCullough Junior High. And at that point, all of our large campuses will be uh, will be handled. We've gone through uh, those campuses uh, with an actual versus uh, projected installation numbers on individual fixtures. Uh, so we're, when we finish McCullough, we're going to reassess, um, and so we don't get into an elementary school and get half the school done uh, before we we're before we run out of the fixtures we bought. Uh, that project is. Uh, uh, way in excess of what the utility company is uh, allowing us for a rebate. Um, the post-installation inspections have already begun uh, in order to qualify for the rebate, was, which was part of our return on investment calculation. Those uh, inspections have to be completed by the end of November. And currently, those are running slightly ahead of schedule. Question. Um, we were at school the other day, and I'm not sure that I understand. I understand from our office the difference between T8 and T12, but we had it ask of us that or, or told to us that they were only replacing the t12s not the t8s and that it was causing you know in the same office area or classroom or whatever I, I, I'm not even going to say that I remember what room it was but obviously you know LED and versus anything T mm -hmm. T anything is going to be considerably different is that where you're running into more of a consumption of the units that we agreed to purchase than what you thought because it's well, absolutely. We ran into some classrooms that had one T12 fixture and six T8 or five T8 fixtures, for example. Uh, so we established, uh, when we started running into that in more than one location, we established a, a, a rule with our contractor. If the room is more than 50% T8, we'll do a swip swap, you know, take T8 from another classroom that got redone to have a full T8 classroom so we don't have a LED on one half and uh, fluorescent on the other half. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. You answered our concern or question or whatever. I mean, at least it was mine anyway. Thanks. Okay. No problem. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Foster? Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item six, business finance, financial reports. Okay, Mr. Rice, if you'll come and back to the podium. I'd like, I'd that. like to give him a pass. Yeah, I mean, since you've already presented once today, we you know, heard pretty much all we want to hear out of you. No, <laughs> Is that? Are you in different, Mr. Rice? Or do you prefer to? Okay. Let's go. Yeah. 
All righty. There is no executive session tonight, so to we have a motion to adjourn. Right, second. We're adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs>